Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the Congress. Thank you for reminding us that you are a good, merciful, and faithful Father, and that you care. We are praying, O oh Lord, every one of us will feel and see your care upon our lives in Jesus' name. That whatever may be happening within or around, we'll know that you are under, everything is under control. And we pray, O oh Lord, that during these days together, you'll strengthen every one of us in the inner man in Jesus' name. And we pray, O oh Lord, will be so strengthened that all the weaknesses of the past, everything will vanish away in Jesus' name. We pray that you'll be glorified in every life. Help us in these studies to bring out things that we need to know so that your word will grant faith, courage, boldness, and strength to every one of us. In Jesus' name, we pray. In the second morning sessions throughout this Congress, we'll be having some special studies. And these studies are taken from the Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Philippians. Each day, by the grace of God, we'll be looking at a chapter each. And today, we're looking at chapter one. And being the first study, we need some kind of introduction uh, to the whole series itself. The title we have placed on chapter one is Joy Under All Circumstances. Joy Under All Circumstances. As you look at Philippians chapter one, reading from verse one, you see it says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Those two verses introduce the whole epistle to us. It talks about Paul, and it talks about his son in the faith, Timothy, and also talks about the church at Philippi. If I need to remind you, you must remember that uh, Paul, in his second missionary journey, he went to Macedonia. And as he got to Macedonia, he got to the city of Philippi. And as he got to Philippi, he saw a group of women that were praying. And he preached the word unto them. It was from that place that Lydia became converted. And then as he continued his ministration there, you remember the damsel, the lady that uh, kept on following after his team. Saying, these are the servants of God that show unto you the way of salvation. She did that many days. And then Paul the apostle rebuked that spirit. It came out. Then the masters of that uh, damsel, they became unhappy. That landed Paul and Silas in the prison. And as they were in the prison, you know the story too well. That I don't need to repeat everything. They began to pray unto the Lord. And they began to sing praises unto the Lord. Even though they were in the prison, they were very joyful. As a result of that, a great miracle took place. And uh, the Philippian jailer himself, with his household, they became born again. A church had been born at Philippi. And now that church continued, even though Paul and Silas had to go to another place, other places, to go and minister. Doesn't something strike you? That church was born in joy. There was adversity. There was persecution. There were problems. There were conflicts. And yet, you see the joy of the Lord was manifested, exercised in the heart of Paul and in the heart of Silas. And the church that had been born in joy during the time of persecution now continued. And as Paul was going to write unto them, that joy was still there. Incidentally, Paul the apostle 
was even at this time now, when he was writing to the Philippians, he was in the prison. Look at verse 13, chapter 1. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And so he was now writing to the Philippians, and he was uh, writing in the joy of the Lord. You start with joy, you continue with joy, and at the end of his Christian life, he said, Now a crown of righteousness is waiting for me. No regrets and uh, no remorse, and no sorrow in his heart. He finished with joy. Isn't that something for the Christian? That you have started your Christian life in joy. The joy of salvation came into you. And you are supposed to continue in that joy of the Lord. And you are supposed to end the race as well in the joy of the Lord. And this epistle is really an epistle of joy. Because as you look at the whole epistle itself, you'll find that many, many times it comes up often and often. The joy, the joy, the joy of the Lord. Look at chapter 1 and in verse 4. Always in every place, always in every prayer of mind for you all, making requests with joy. In chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, What then, notwithstanding, everywhere, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, I will rejoice. In chapter 1 and verse 26, talking about joy, that your rejoicing may be more abundant, in Christ Jesus for me by my coming to you again. And now in chapter 2, he still continues the theme of joy. In verse 2, fulfill my joy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like my dead, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Verse 17, verse 18, ye. And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Chapter 3 verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is saved. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now in chapter 4, reading from verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. So you will find that in every chapter, whether it's one or two or three or four, you find the joy, the joy of the Lord. But he's very careful to tell you it is joy in Christ. Because he was in Christ, he had joy. And because the Philippians were in Christ, they had joy. And because you are in Christ, you ought to have joy. And so, in all circumstances, in all situations, that Paul the Apostle found himself, he had joy. But remember, that joy started at the point of salvation. And that joy continued even to the very last breath here on earth. Now come back to chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And we'll look at the introduction now. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. You may want to underline that word, the servants. And then it says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. That's another word, saints, which are at Philippi. And then you have verse 2, grace be unto you. And peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three things that come out in the introduction. Number one, the saints. Number two, the servants. And number three, the salutation. You will see here, he referred to himself and he referred to Timothy as the servants of Jesus Christ. They were saved, so they were children of God. But then they had been called into the ministry to proclaim the gospel and to lift up the Lord and now they came to put themselves under the control of the master and they became the servants of the Lord and it is telling you and telling me that that's the attitude that you ought to have, I ought to have when we come into the ministry and there is a language that should be in the mouth of the servants of the Lord look at that in 2 Samuel chapter 15 verse 15 2 Samuel, 
chapter 15, verse 15. It says, And the king and the king's servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. Take this Old Testament verse and look at the king of kings and the lord of lords, the one who has become your savior and your master, and read that verse again only with a little a little difference which is the k there for the king it's not the capital k because now you are referring to christ and the king's servants paul and timotheus and the king's servants silas and all the other apostles and the king's servants those of us who are here today say unto the king with a capital k behold thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord with a capital l the king capital k king of kings shall appoint that should be the language of every child of god that now you have submitted yourself to the lord you have received him as your savior and the lord and every time you are saying i'm a servant of the lord anything and everything that my lord the king will appoint i am willing to do I am ready to do. And so in Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, servants of Jesus Christ. These were people that have been so saved and have been so transformed that anytime and anywhere, every time or whatever circumstance, they were willing, they were ready without question. And they were willing without any reservation to do whatsoever the Lord, the King, King of Kings will appoint. But then, as these were servants of God, they were writing, or Paul the Apostle, uh, with the support and companionship of Timothy, was writing unto the believers at Philippi. And what did he call the believers at Philippi? It says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now you will see that many people today, they do not have understanding of who the children of God are. Do you see what some denominations do? They will say, this one is Church of St. Paul. And then they will say that this other one is the Church of St. Peter. They never refer to anybody as a saint while the fellow is still alive. But if they have died, uh, the gospel according to St. Matthew, and the gospel according to St. Mark, and the gospel according to St. Luke, and the gospel according to St. John, once those people have died, then they canonize them to become saints. But you know, it wasn't like that at that time. In the New Testament, the people that were born again, the people that were children of God, those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, and they are called unto holiness and sanctification. They are to live saintly lives. Therefore, it says, to all the saints, it wasn't that some of their leaders were saints and the members were not saints. All the people in Philippi, whether they were new converts or they were old converts, whether they were leaders or followers or disciples, they were all saints. They were called saints because they had the life of Christ in them, which was a life that was set apart separated from the sins and the pollutions of the world and they were now to live in righteousness and holiness their lives are to be totally identified with the life of christ the holy one so it says to all the saints in christ jesus you cannot be a saint outside christ except you come into christ you will not be a new creature and you will not be a saint and then it says which are philippine with the bishops that means with the overseers and the deacons and the leaders and the workers in that church now he brings salutation in verse 2 he says grace unto you they had been saved how were they saved by grace are you saved through faith and again that grace that started the christian journey was to continue with them in the christian journey and then even at the very end of their christian life they were still to have that grace with them grace be unto you and peace they started with peace when they were born again being justified by faith you have peace with god but you must keep on in that relationship with god and you must keep in that peace and it's from god our father and from our and from the lord jesus christ 
something is very clear here. There can be no grace and peace without you passing through the cross. That is, you come to the Lord, and because of the grace of God, you have peace with God. No peace without grace. No grace and peace except it's coming from God. And no grace and peace from God except in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at those two verses again. Number one, the servants, our labor in the Lord. Number two, the saints, that is, our life in Christ. And number three, the salutation, the love that was shared together. And so you see that Paul the Apostle, he begins this epistle by the life we live, the labor that we render, and the love we manifest one to another. And now as we come to chapter 1, reading from verse 3 now, we're going to divide into four parts. Number one, prayer and thanksgiving prayer and thanksgiving you find that in verses 3 to 11 and then preaching the truth that's point number two preaching the truth verses 12 to 18 and then number three the preacher's priority at all times the preacher's priority at all times that's uh, from verse 19 to verse 26 and now number four perseverance and triumph perseverance and triumph in verses 27 to 30 we come to number one which is uh, prayer and thanksgiving look at it from verse 3 i thank my god upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now paul was suffering in the prison at that time he was suffering persecution even at the time in which he was writing his circumstances were uh, unpleasant and yet the joy of the lord was there and the joy of the lord was his strength in spite of personal suffering he was thankful unto god and he kept praying for others and you find that in all the epistles that he wrote from prison. There are four epistles that are clearly written from the prison. One, you have the Ephesians. Two, you have the Philippians. And then three, you have the Colossians. And then four, you have Philemon. And in all those four that he wrote from the prison, you will find that he forgot himself. He forgot his circumstances. He forgot his suffering. He forgot his persecution. And he remembered other people. And he prayed for them. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In verse uh, 15 and 16. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love to all the saints, living saints, not dead saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You see, he was in the prison, and yet at the same time, he was telling the people, I remember you. I'm not even praying for myself. I'm praying for you. How do we know he was in the prison? Chapter 6 of Ephesians, verse uh, 20. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. I am, at the time of writing, an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And yet, from the prison writing to them, he was uh, thanking God for them, and he was, at that same time, praying for them. Colossians chapter 1, and in verse 3, we give thanks to God, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you praying always for you in verse 9 for this cause we also since the day we had it do not cease to pray for you to and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding and here we learn a lesson from paul the apostle that if we're really going to carry out our ministry the way we should carry it out we will forget ourselves. We will concentrate on other people. 
because you really will not be able to fulfill your ministry when you are concentrating on your problems when you forget others and you only remember yourself remember you are not just uh, an isolated christian now you are not just on your way to heaven you are calling other people and taking other people to heaven with you you are a minister a father in the lord a mother in israel a mother in the lord and therefore you have children and you have disciples and you have people that are looking up to you you'll forget yourself like a mother will forget herself and forget her problem and take care of the children and that we learn from paul the apostle that he forgot himself and the more you forget yourself the more you'll be able to fulfill the ministry that the lord has called you to and in uh, philippians chapter 1 you see what he says in verse 5 for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now this fellowship with them and their fellowship with one another all that kind of fellowship was maintained even under adverse conditions now he expressed confidence in god in verse 6 he says being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of jesus christ now you see this verse this verse is a wonderful verse but it's a kind of verse that uh, the two camps of the Christian of Christendom uh, they run away from this verse. On the one hand, we have the Calvinists in the kingdom. On the other hand, we have the Armenians in the kingdom. The Calvinists are the people that say, "Once you are saved, you are forever saved, and no matter what happens, and no matter what you do." you are saved therefore rejoice in the lord the armenians are the people that say no although you are saved if you go back into sin then there is a problem and if you die in that sin then you will not be able to get to heaven and so you will find that the armenians those who say that you can lose your salvation relationship with god they run away from this verse because there is too much of confidence in the verse there is too much of promise in the verse and there is too much that will take the side of the Calvinists in the verse and the Calvinists themselves they will look at the verse and say there you are once you are saved once God has started something he will finish nothing and they will say didn't you see what Paul the apostle has written being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of jesus christ well the thing is the important thing is for you to understand that he wrote to the philippians talking about the power of god he wrote to them talking about the sovereignty of god he wrote to them that you don't need to have your mind shaking at all the Lord who has saved you is able to keep you from falling. And there is no doubt about it. There should be confidence in the heart of a child of God of this very thing that what God has started he is able to perform it until the final day. Is he not able? I said, is he not able? Of course he's able. But then we need to balance it up with Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 Wherefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your salvation with fear and trembling you see that's what the Calvinists they miss out they miss out chapter 2 and they remain in chapter 1 they do not know there are two sides to the coin there is the sovereignty of god there is the responsibility of man that on the side of god he has the power on the side of man he must have the willingness on the side of god he is able to keep on the side of man you must have the willingness to be kept on the side of god we are confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you is able to perform it until the final day the day of christ on the side of man you will not submit yourself to christ and that he says you will always be obedient to the lord so that 
it will so happen. You'll be walking out that salvation with fear and trembling. And yet Paul told them in verse 13, chapter 2, verse 13, For it is God which walketh in you. Yes, God is at work. But you too, you must be at work. There is God's work. There is man's work. And when you bring everything together, God enabling man and man yielding to God, that's how you have the complete thing. He see that walketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Then in Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 7, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. You see, his concern and his thoughts were always upon these uh, Philippians. He loved them so much. He was always thinking about them. And he was always praying for them. And then in verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve the things which are, that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Now we learn something from the prayer of Paul the Apostle. It gives us a, an illustration, an example, a model for you to pray for members of your church. What have you been praying for? If you look at the prayer items, the prayer requests that come in, and the prayers we pray in the church, and we compare with these, can we say we are praying apostolic prayer? Can we say we are praying by inspiration? Can we say we are praying according to the mind of the Spirit? And yet, if you look at the prayers of Paul the Apostle for the churches that established, you will see that spiritual things were more important, more essential in those prayers than material things. Now look at the prayer he prayed for them. And look at the points one by one. Number one, that your love may abound. He knew that love was so central and so essential. And whatever these uh, Philippians had, if they didn't have love, if they didn't have this charity, there will be nothing. And therefore, he was praying for them so that his work with them will not be in vain. He said, I'm praying for you that your love will remain, your love will abound. And in fact, it says that your love will increase yet more and more. And so you know the kind of prayer you ought to be praying for yourself, for your family members, and for the members of the church. But then he qualifies now this love. Because the tendency is for love to become so sentimental that the love will not be according to the word of God. How did he qualify the kind of love he was praying for? He said that the love will be with knowledge or it will be in knowledge that is the love will be based on the truth of the word of god it will be with the full understanding of righteous principles you see you have to measure your love that way and a kind of love you ought to pray for yourself and pray for the people in the church is a kind of love that will have knowledge a kind of love that will be symmetrical a kind of love that will be balanced. A kind of love that will have righteous principles underneath it and behind it. And then in that verse 9, it says, in all judgment. That's what judgment just means, discernment. That you will discern how to be able to manifest that love. And it will be the impartial, pure love of the Lord that discerns all situations and knows the measure and knows the how to manifest that love. Now number two, he also says in verse 10, that she may approve the things that are excellent. He wanted those uh, Philippian believers to become matured. He wanted them to become adult believers. He wanted them to be able to make a difference between good and bad. He wanted them to be able to make a difference between good and better. 
he wanted them to be able to make a difference between the better and the best and therefore he said i am praying for you that you will not be infant christians i'm praying for you that you will not be ignorant christians i'm praying for you not be immature christians you'll be able to approve the things not only the things that are good not only the things that are better even the very best you'll be able to approve the things that are excellent that means they will know how to take decisions in life and you see that's the prayer you are praying for the young converts you want them to grow up you want them to develop that they will be able to approve the things that are excellent he joins something else in his prayer in verse 10 that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of christ he knew that hypocrisy or lip service or superficiality was very very common in that day and it's still very common today and he says the prayer i'm praying for my own converts the prayer i'm praying for these philippian christians who have come to know the lord is that they will be sincere there will be no hypocrisy there will be no superficiality at all and they will be without offense within without around in the private in the public they will be without offense they will live the victorious life not just for one week not just for one year from now until the day of christ and then in verse 11 being filled with the fruits of righteousness it's it didn't just say being filled with righteousness when you have christ you have righteousness when you are full of christ you have the righteousness of christ and because you are in christ you are in righteousness and righteousness is in you but he says i'm not satisfied with that i want to see the evidence i want to see the fruit i want to see the manifestation and what i'm praying for you is that you will be filled with the fruits the evidences and the marks of righteousness which are by christ jesus unto the glory and the praise of god so that your life will be bringing glory and bringing praise unto the lord and so you will see the prayer and the thanksgiving that uh, paul the apostle rendered concerning the philippians now we go to point number two preaching the truth preaching the truth here we come to some verses that you really have to study very well and understand if you are going to get the nugget, the gem out of the verses we are looking at. Look at it from verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the fortress of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the parlors and in all other places. Let's stop there for a moment. Here he was talking about his imprisonment. He was talking about his persecution. He said, you people out there, in the free world you are not under any chain you are not in any imprisonment how are you feeling outside there are you pitching my condition here that uh, paul is in the prison paul is in chains what a pity for that man you are saying he said no don't you remember the word of god that all things work together for good for them that love god who are called according to his purpose and don't you know i was called of god and don't you know that i was called according to his purpose in fact i have a testimony to tell and he was almost indirectly telling them i in the prison here suffering persecution i have more testimony than you people there in the free world that are not suffering at all he says i want you to know this i want you to understand this brethren that the things which have happened unto me they have rather they contributed to the progress of the gospel propagation of the gospel rather than being a hindrance to the gospel so that now in my bonds in christ all that bond and the message of christ is manifest in all the parlors the people that will never come to my crusade now i'm meeting them and the soldiers that are chained unto me in the prison here the people i can never get to their houses i'll never be able to get to their barracks now they chain them to me and while they chain them to me i begin to ask them questions and then from that we talk about christ and from that i'm preaching the gospel to them and before they change them that is 
is for them for shifting for another soldier to take part he has fully understood the gospel and i encourage him to keep on praying i will see you in heaven if i don't see you here on earth again and then they bring a new soldier again the following day and i say how are you you are doing your duty don't feel bad i'm here and do you know why i'm here i'm in the prison because of jesus christ have you ever heard about jesus christ and then he begins to preach the gospel and he was still winning souls to the lord and he says is that not what life is all about that whether you're in the free world or you're in the prison you have only one thing to do and there's only one life to live and that life you're living it to preach the gospel and now it's for the portraits of the gospel in fact the people that will not have known about the lord jesus christ now they know about the lord jesus christ and he says i'm happy i am here do you see how a man can have joy in all circumstances whether it's in his house or it's in the church or it's in the field or it's in any place suffering persecution the joy of the lord will always be there there is a verse in the old testament it's in psalm 76 and in verse 10 it says surely the wrath of man shall praise thee now think about it a minute why did those people arrest paul and why did they put him in the prison? Was it not to stop the work he was doing? Was it not to silence him? Was it not so that this gospel will not be spreading? Because this is the champion of those preachers. But then when they became angry with him, and they persecuted him, and they put him in the prison, what they said will not be done, it was still being done. And surely at that time, and surely at this time, the wrath of man will praise the Lord in your life. If they get angry, let them get angry. A testimony will come for you out of that anger. And therefore, you rest assured in the Lord, according to the word of the Lord in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. You know it, but let's look at it again. And we know that all things, not some things, not many things, you should have that confidence in your own heart, that confidence in your own life. Are you not a child of God? Are you not called by God? Is the Lord not watching over your life? Why do you think some things are happening that I don't understand this? Why do you have to understand? Your Heavenly Father understands. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so even though persecution came, he still continued preaching the gospel. That reminds us of the early believers in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 from verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. But look at verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They still kept on preaching the word, even though they had been scattered abroad because of the persecution. Now, the persecution of Paul the Apostle, the imprisonment of Paul the Apostle, you see now, it had an effect upon the unbelievers, upon the soldiers, the people in the palace that didn't know the Lord before, his imprisonment had an effect upon them. But now it's not just that. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear you know when your life influences some believers and your life influences believers that's a good life that's a fulfilled life that's a life that is fulfilling the purpose for which you are in existence now there were people in the free world they were not in the prison and they were not being persecuted they were brethren they were children of god they said see paul the apostle he is in the prison and even in his imprisonment he is preaching the gospel we who are not in the prison why are we not preaching the gospel so they became more bold or bolder in preaching the word of god but then there were some other people too the imprisonment of paul also affected them in verse 15 some indeed preach christ even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill the imprisonment of Paul the Apostle, 
It, uh, it affected sinners, outright sinners, those who met in the palace. It affected loving, caring Christians, real children of God. It also affected insincere Christians. It affected the people that are not even standing well. And those people now, the imprisonment of Paul the Apostle gave them a message to preach. And they began to say, you see that? You see what we're talking about? Paul does not have the real message, the good message, and the acceptable message. If he had the acceptable message, why is he in the prison? If he is preaching the truth, why is not a God the God of peace? And the God of the gospel is preaching, why is he not supporting him? And because of envy and because of strife, they began to preach another gospel. In verse 16, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bond. You see those people, they thought they could make Paul miserable. Make him unhappy. Make him feel God has rejected you. That's why you are going through what you are going through. He said, that's what they suppose. I said, but the other in verse 17, of love. Knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. He says, what then? Notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. I want you to see the attitude of Paul the Apostle. He said, I know they are not preaching the truth. I know they are not really testifying the right thing about the Lord. But he said, now, I'm not even going to sit on the judgment seat. I'm not going to usurp the position and the place of God and the place of Christ, who is the final judge. All I am doing here in the prison is that I'm rejoicing. Because whether they know it or not, at least they are mentioning Christ. At least they are preaching something. And people that wouldn't have heard about the name of Jesus and the cross of Christ and the blood of Christ and the death he died and the grace of God, at least they are hearing God will judge their motive. I leave that in the hands of God. God will judge whether they are preaching sincerely or not. I leave that in the hands of God. But I am so happy. That my life affects almost everybody, every category of people in the world. Sinners, sincere believers, insincere believers, my life affects everyone. And if you come to Job, Job chapter 16. You see, it's not everyone that is uh, preaching something that is preaching with sincerity. That is preaching uh, the truth with a good motive. Uh, you remember Job was suffering just like Paul the Apostle was suffering. And uh, the friends of Job, uh, it was an opportunity for them to preach. But they were preaching to the wrong person and they were preaching the wrong message. But if you look at their messages, they were mentioning God. They were mentioning the protection of God. They were mentioning the preservation of God. And they were saying, have you seen Job? Job, have you seen anybody, a good person really suffering like you are suffering? God is not like that. And they confused the whole thing. And then in Job chapter 16 from verse 1, Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things, miserable comforters are ye all. Shall vain words have um, shall shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldens thee that thou answerest? I could also speak as ye do, if your soul were in my soul's stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. But I will strengthen you if I were if you were in my position suffering and I was in your position as a friend coming to you, I will strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips shall assuage your grief, will alleviate your suffering, will take your problem away. But see the way you are talking. It's true you are talking about God. It's true you are talking about his justice. It's true you are talking about his judgment. But you are applying your word to the wrong man. That's what those people were doing in the New Testament. They were accusing Paul. And they were saying, you see that Paul is not preaching the right thing. That's why that is happening to him. But eventually, Job had told them, you are miserable comforters. It's better to shut up than to add to my problem. And then in chapter 42, God now spoke to those people. In chapter 42 of Job, verse 7, and it was so 
that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me uh, the thing that is right, as my servant uh, Job has. Now, can you see this? Eventually, the Lord came to those uh, friends and he said, You friends of Job, you have not uh, spoken right. You have not done well. All the things you are saying with confidence and boldness and assurance, and you are saying, We know it is so. You cannot apply that to Job. And you know there are many people like that today. They'll be saying something not completely right. They'll be preaching something not completely truthful. And they'll be saying it with real force and energy. You will think that they were speaking the right thing. Let's come back to Job. Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5. And in verse 27. And see the assurance with, with which they were speaking. They were talking to Job. They said, lo, this, we have searched it, so it is. Hear it and know it for thy good. That's how they spoke. And at the end of the whole book, the Lord called them and said, You've been talking with assurance, or you've been talking with boldness, you've been talking with confidence, and you have been challenging Job, saying, No, we have searched it out. It was thorough research. It is so. Job, hear it, know it for thy good. And then God said, Everything you said was totally wrong. And so now, you come back to Paul the Apostle. It's Paul the Apostle said, oh, I can judge them. I know the real principles of the gospel. I know the things that are right. I know the things they ought to be saying. But let's leave that for the moment now. I'm even happy that as a result of my chain, as a result of my problem, they are now emboldened and they are preaching the gospel. I will not judge them. I will leave their judgment into the hands of the Almighty God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and in verse 14. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14 For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good and whether it be evil. There will be a final day of judgment when our motives will be judged, our messages will be judged, and our manners will be judged. Everything we have done will be judged and Paul said, I leave it until that final day. As for now, I do not want to judge any of them. I'm just rejoicing here in the prison because in whatever they are doing, the gospel is being preached. And I think we too should have that same attitude. That we have the attitude that the word of God is being preached. And even though sometimes we know that they are not preaching the right thing, some of those people, yet we still rejoice that somehow, somewhere, somebody is mentioning the name of Christ. And now we go to point number three. The preacher's priority at all times. And we learn this from Paul the Apostle. Uh, Paul was really a wonderful man, a man of God, a real apostle. And here was the real priority of his life. And you can see everything coming out, coming through him as he was in the prison. Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 19. It says, For I know that they shall turn to my salvation. That means to my release from the prison. You know, it's wonderful when you read the Bible, uh, you should not just take a single meaning for every time the word appears. You know, you come across salvation. And every time you see that salvation, you think it means being born again. And every time you see that salvation, you, you think it means now repent, give your life to the Lord, have the joy of salvation, your sins taken away. No, but you know, Paul was saved. He was a real child of God. The word salvation is used in different, different ways. You will look at the context before you know the meaning of that word. It says, for I know that they shall turn to my release from the prison, will turn to my deliverance, will turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. In the prison, but I'm not ashamed. When I come out, I will not be ashamed. In all the work I'm doing for the Lord, I'll not be ashamed. In any report that anybody is giving somewhere, I will not be ashamed. In my private life, I will not be ashamed. The grace of God was so full in his life that he said, In nothing shall I be ashamed. But that, with all boldness, as always, so now, 
also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. You know, the language of Paul the Apostle actually was very, very strong. And you know what he was saying here? He was saying that the Lord will be magnified in his own life. And he was talking of the fellowship that he had with the Lord. You see the, the life of this man, it was completely in the hands of the Lord. And now he brings us a word, a sentence that uh, many people have heard, but I don't know whether they know the meaning. In verse 21, for me to live is Christ. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He said, uh, you know what? For me to live, and it doesn't matter whether I'm living in a village or living in a city. For me to live, and it doesn't matter whether you find me in the Jerusalem palace or you find me in the Roman prison. For me to live, and it doesn't matter whether I'm living among the believers, you know, in the church meeting, in a conference, and all the believers are surrounding me, and there is no single unbeliever there. Or I'm surrounded by unbelievers, and there are problems there. It doesn't matter where I am. Christ is with me. For me to live is Christ. And then he said to die is gain. He said, think about it, I've seen the thought heavens. And think about it, I've been to paradise in Revelation and vision. Think about it, I've heard unspeakable words. And I've heard the songs of those angels. And as I'm living here, for me to live is Christ and to die. In fact, I cannot imagine the glory, the joy that it will be. And to go and hear those songs I heard before. And to go and see those angels I saw before. And just a moment I was granted a chance to be over there. And now to live there for hundreds and thousands and millions of years. Don't you understand that? Then, to die is gain. As he was talking about this, he was talking about the very center of his life and the very priority of his life. You know, this apostle Paul, fellowship with Christ was the joy of his life. That's why he said, Why am I alive here? And it doesn't matter the physical condition. I'm in fellowship with the Lord, and that's the joy of my life. Number two, the spirit of Christ was the force of his life. For me to live is Christ. He said, the very force of my life. He said, the thing that gets me going, moving me, energizing me, stirring me up, it is the spirit of Christ within me. Number three, the love of Christ was the propelling power of his life. And he says, you know, Christ is in me. And his love is just giving me energy and propelling power every time, number four, the will of Christ was a law of his life. That's why he said, for me to live is Christ. There is a governing law in my life. And that is the very will of Christ. And then number five, the glory of Christ was the goal and the purpose of his life. The glory of Christ. That's all he wanted. And that's what he wanted to live for. Wanting to live for the Lord. Just the Lord alone. And then what did he mean by saying? For me to die is gain. He said, hey, that's what I'm looking for. There's no crown now. Only the cross. And when I die, I will put aside this cross. And I will have the crown. Therefore, for me to live now with the cross, that's joy to me. Because that's the very life of Christ. That identifies me with Christ. Therefore, to live is Christ. But when I die, then the crown will come. For me to die is even gain. The same thing with you and with me. If you are all for Christ, when you are living as you are living now, then you will find when you die, Christ will be all for you. You are all for Christ now. For you to live is Christ. Then when you die, Christ will be all for you. And then let's see this kind of uh, this kind of thing that he had in his mind, which every one of us actually ought to have in our mind as well. In Colossians chapter three, verses one and two, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. And make that the priority of your own life at all times, in all places. And then in uh, Psalm 71, Psalm 71, and in verse 18. Psalm 71, verse 18. Now also, when I am old and gray headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. 
what do we link this with Paul the Apostle? You know, Paul the Apostle, the, from the moment he knew the Lord, he started in the business of the gospel, just preaching the gospel. At Damascus there, he preached the gospel. They persecuted him. They wanted to kill him. And then they threw, uh, they, they let him down, uh, threw the basket over the wall. When he got to Jerusalem, what was he doing? Going in and coming out with the children of God, preaching the gospel. Everywhere he went, just preaching the gospel. And whenever they, you know, locked him up in the prison, he didn't, he couldn't have crusade. Personal witnessing evangelism, so when was going on, were the people that were being changed to him. And then, whenever those people were tired and, you know, he couldn't talk to them anymore, he will take his pen in the prison there, and the Spirit of God will fill him in that prison, like the Spirit of God did not fill even the people that were outside the prison. Inspiration will come. Illumination will come. Revelation will come. He'll begin to write those epistles, and he wrote those epistles even though he was locked up, the work of God was going on. He had not only shown the power of God, the grace of God unto this generation, his own generation, but he showed the power of God, the grace of God unto everyone that is to come. And we're still benefiting from the ministry of Paul the Apostle today. He served his generation and by the inspired writing, he's serving us today, generations beyond his own generation. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. I know not. He had a dilemma. And you know, not everybody has this kind of dilemma. In fact, the majority of people don't have any dilemma like this. Have you ever thought about this kind of dilemma that uh, Paul the Apostle had? He said, if the Lord will tell me now and say, Paul, what do you want? You are in the prison and you are suffering. And there is not even candle light in the place where you are. And the dungeon is smelling. And uh, Paul, should I take you to heaven now? Or should I leave you on earth? He says, ordinary Christian will say, oh Lord, take me away from this place. This is enough. I need to leave this place. Paul, the apostle says, I don't know what I will choose. Whether I will tell the Lord to take me to heaven and go and enjoy. But he said, no, my heart is here. As long as there's still one sinner that has not been saved. As long as there's one immature Christian that needs to be matured. As long as the church to be built somewhere. As long as missionary work to be done somewhere. I can't get to heaven now. I can't go to heaven now. I am ready. I'm qualified. I am saved. I am sanctified. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. There's even a crown of righteousness waiting for me. But let that thing wait. I want more business for the Lord. Are you like that? That even if the Lord were to say, can you come up to heaven now? You say, God, give me more chance. I want to preach more. I want to witness more. I want to pray for the sick more. I want to serve you more. Because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then in verse 23, I am in a strait between two. Having a desire to depart which, and to be with Christ, which is better, a far better. Nevertheless, in verse 24, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know I shall abide. I know heaven is there. I'm not in a hurry. I'll get there eventually. And it's going to be a wonderful thing. The reward is going to be great. But I have this confidence that the Lord will not take me now. Because I want to minister more to you. Knowing that I shall abide and continue with you all. For the fortress or and joy of your faith. He wanted to help somebody somewhere. To increase in faith. And to increase in the things of the Lord. That your rejoicing may be more abundant. They were already rejoicing. Because they were saved. They were children of God. But that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Now we go to point number four, which is perseverance and triumph. Perseverance and triumph. And we look at it now from verse 27. It says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, when you read the Bible, King James uh, Version in particular, you need to take note of some words. Because some words, uh, they, are, uh, they are not keeping the same meaning as uh, we have today. When you talk about conversation today, you are talking about one somebody talking to another person. But in this verse 27, that let your conversation... 
and that word was taken uh, was uh, translated from Greek but uh, they kept the Latin uh, kind of uh, connotation because the word conversari in uh, Latin means to conduct oneself and so when it says let your conversation it's talking about your conduct it's talking about your character it's talking about the way that you conduct yourself. It's talking about your manner of life. If you read it with that understanding now, verse 27, only let your manner of life, only let your character, only let your conduct be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your fears, that ye stand fast, in one spirit with one mind and then it says striving together for the faith of the gospel he wanted there to be obedience he says do you remember i told you in verse one you are saints if you are saints you must be holy if you are saints you must be obedient and therefore let your conversation your lifestyle be as it befits the gospel of the lord jesus christ let there be unity in one spirit in one mind you are working together you are striving together for the faith of the gospel and whether the preacher is there or the preacher is not there just make sure you are living the life that you ought to live in the lord in verse 28 and in nothing be terrified by your adversaries he said that's the life i live that's what gives me victory all the people in the praetoria all the people in the palace of caesar all the people that have visited me in the prison here either officially or otherwise they know there is no terror they know there is no fear of man and they know that i'm still victorious here i'm confident in lord in the lord here you do the same thing over there where you are in nothing be terrified by your adversaries which to them is an evident token of perdition it will make them to understand an evident token of perdition. That means that they will say, with all the money they have, with all the privileges they have, with all the comfort they have, they are sorrowful. With all the things they have, they are dejected and miserable. With all the problems these people have, they are joyful. They are happy. It will then make them to begin to think that if riches will not uh, bring any joy to them, and if poverty will not take the joy of these people away, it's an evident token of their perdition. But to you, it's of salvation. That's the final deliverance and the final day. And that of God, for unto you, it is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake he said when you got to christ and you got married to the lord you have everything that he has the riches of glory yes it belongs to christ you have it too but then you have the persecution too because the hatred they have towards christ you have that too the opposition they have towards christ you have that too and the conflict that you see in us uh, suffering for the gospel you have that too therefore it is given unto you not only to believe that's a wonderful thing but immediately you believe everything belonging to christ also comes to you having the same conflict which is so in me and here now to be in me but he said you know this is i do not bother us at all because you're talking about conflict but then you know that christ is near and christ is greater than the conflict he is the conqueror and because the conqueror is so near that's greater than the conflict and because he's the captain of our salvation because this captain of our salvation is so near the little conflict you see they are intangible infinitesimal and they are nothing to be compared with Christ in us, the hope of glory. And they are not anything to be compared with the conqueror. He that is within us is greater than he that is in the world. And they are not as great. They don't come anywhere near the captain of our salvation. I'm asking you this morning, is this Christ in you? And do you have this conqueror living within you? And do you have this captain of salvation always going before you and this intimate and close relationship between you and Christ? If that is so, there is nothing to worry about in the world. He that is within us is greater than he that was in the world. We're talking about joy under all circumstances. Are you joyful today? The joy of the Lord. Is it your strength? And can you make up your mind that if Paul the Apostle will be so joyful like this, even in the prison, and be hopeful, and be positive, and be so much at a large, and he didn't feel that anything was going wrong, he just felt happy. 
the greatest happiness a man could have. If that happened to Paul at that time, how about you? Just forget about the things you are thinking about and be happy in the Lord. You will be joyful. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. And then even your adversaries, they will see that there is nothing they can say. There is nothing they can do which will ever make you miserable. Once you come into the boat of the kingdom and you are sailing through to heaven, there is uh, no unhappiness again that shall tie you down. Rise up and rejoice in the Lord. This is an epistle of joy. And you want to tell the Lord during this week as the Lord will be opening the verses unto, unto us. The priority of your life, the purpose of your life, the goal of your life, the preaching in your ministry. And everything that surrounds you and surrounds your ministry. It will be full of the joy of the Lord. Be joyful in the Lord. Remember that we are saints. Are you living a holy life? Remember that we are servants of the Lord. Are you giving your life to the Lord and saying, Lord, I am ready to do whatsoever my Lord the King will command. Do you pray for your converts? Do you pray for members of the church? Or are you always thinking about yourself? Always thinking about your problem? How you do like Paul the Apostle? That in the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the problems, for me to live is Christ. The priority of your life will be that you are living for Christ and for Christ alone. Do you love the people you are ministering to so much? That if the Lord will say, would you want to go to heaven immediately now? You'll tell the Lord, can you give me some chance to preach more? Pray for the people more? Love the people more? Care for them more? Enlighten them more? Instruct them more? Mature them more? Is the work of the Lord so important? So high in your mind? That you will say, I don't even know what I will choose. Whether to go to heaven immediately or still to stay here. Oh, that man was a victorious man. Let that same victory radiate from you. Let that same joy radiate from you. That church in Philippi started with joy. Paul and Silas singing in the prison. And Paul continued in that joy. It wasn't just joy for one year, joy for two years. All through his life, the joy continued. Does the joy of the Lord continue in your life? Are you living to the glory of God? Letting your conversation, your manner of life, your character, your conduct be as it befits and becomes the gospel. 